<laughs> All right, hey, welcome guys. Glad to be here. It's my first time presenting at a really a classical uh, PowerShell day. Uh, glad you can make it. Uh, today I want to discuss something that's very near and dear to me. It's uh, classes, uh, specifically for operational guys transitioning to dev. Most of us, uh, how many developers are in the house tonight? Today? Developers? Okay, okay, okay. If you're a developer, well then, you might have really much for this. But uh, like I said, my name is Irvin. And, uh, <laughs> oops, sorry. I recently uh, joined uh, Metis as a senior uh, consultant. Metis is uh, Jeff Walters' uh, company. And uh, I'm still not uh, sure about the senior part. If I'm senior or I'm senior, I'm 48 years old, so I'm kind of old, so. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, OK. My name is Irvin Strecken. It's really a Scottish name. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, anybody playing from the Scottish uh, PowerShell group? No, not today? Well, I guess uh, if I ever do a presentation uh, for the Scottish group, uh, I'll probably have to put on a kilter. <laughs> but anyway, so. Let me just slide this one. Where did my mouse go? Oh, here it is. Now, first off, uh, like Rob said, this is our sponsors for today. So let's uh, give a round of applause to the guys and for really sponsors of today for us. Eh? <laughs> so this is a little bit about me. Uh, I enjoy blogging. You can find me at uh, my own uh, blog site, uh, my GitHub and Twitter account, and I do some contribution uh, to the PowerShell community. Uh, I guess the easiest way to hear with me is uh, on Twitter. Uh, if you join, or if you just uh, send out uh, a link, uh, I'll be sure to uh, follow you. So today, what I'd like to discuss a little bit is uh, classes that's new to PowerShell version 5. We'll get into some basic stuff. and. We're going to also look at what we did before classes. There'll be some code. And what we can do with classes, there'll be some more code. And some takeaway and comments. All right. So PowerShell classes, new to PowerShell version 5. Uh, I remember when I saw classes for the first time, that was uh, Ben Hillens used it for DSC uh, resources. And I thought to myself, this is some awesome technology. I can't really imagine that it's only for writing DSC resources. So I got on Twitter, and I just sent out a tweet to the guys, hey, I'm looking into PowerShell classes. Anyone using classes instead of PS custom objects on a regular basis? So I asked Doug Fink. Doug is uh, he's really a developer, and uh, he's kind of my hero. He really uh, broke it down for me when I asked about how can I really get into classes? There were a lot of presentations, a lot of uh, uh, theories, but it was all about cars and stuff like that. It was like, okay, I, it didn't really resonate with me. And once uh, I got in contact with Doug, he broke it down for me, and uh, yeah, I'd like to share with you today what I learned along the way. So uh, this is a fun fact. Oops. Fun fact. <laughs> this year at the PowerShell uh, conference in uh, in Europe, in Hanover. I was talking classes with a .NET developer. That's when I realized I'm really an ops guy. I'm all excited about it. And the .NET developer was just looking. He was really friendly and just looked at me and nod and smiled. <laughs> and then that's when I figured out that talking dev classes with a .NET dev is like a scrawny guy talking about his sick games. Man, I got to stay humble. <laughs> and this was Jeffy Snowball's reply. He was like, yeah, I thought Bruce uh, broke it down and I see that there was enough support as Python. And I was like, OK, cool. So Python. I just made a small note. Should look into Python. Anyone saw the keynote from uh, Jeffy Snowball? And where there's about uh, transformative change. And when he said that uh, PowerShell was, uh, is PowerShell done? And when he said yes, I kind of died inside a little. It was like, seriously? And no. So <laughs> we dodged that bullet. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so classes. Uh, you want to know about classes? The best way to do is uh, get help about classes. And anyone followed the session from Luke this morning about DSC? Cool. So the scenario I want to get into right now is uh, really about defining custom types for Windows PowerShell, a bit of object-oriented programming. Uh, that's also one of the, the possibilities, not just writing uh, DSC resources. And once you get accustomed to that, it's probably, well, at least I hope you'll be excited enough to look into it after this session. So, okay, we're gonna get into the basic stuff. Not too much to bore you, we're getting to the code just now. If you guys are like me, you probably uh, learn a lot more by looking at code. So, when you think of a class structure, classes are a way to just get everything in one place. Uh, think of it as a template with variables, and you also have properties and methods, and you can just make like a, a model that you can replicate. And once you replicate it, you can actually manipulate that instance and that instance alone. I can be a little more evident once we get started. The default with the classes is that you have properties. Now properties are just uh, like the custom objects. You have a variable, you can give it a value, and you can also manipulate that value once it's there, validate and stuff like that. Now for methods, you have different uh, ways. Uh, methods is just a fancy way of keeping functions stuck to a class. And there are different types of uh, methods. There are specific types of methods. One specific one is the constructor. That has to be the name of the class. And you have different ways and different uh, methods that you can also implement. Uh, you can overload your, your constructor depending on the properties you want to add to it. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. There are also uh, different types. You have uh, the, the static type. That is really a, a, a method that you don't have to instantiate, but you can just call it once you, you have the, the class defined. And then there's also this lovely variable, this. This is uh, kind of the equivalent of the dollar underscore. If you want to manipulate your code in your structure, in your class, you have to use this variable. And it's not something that's really new. You'll see it later on in also a different code. And it's been there, it's been dormant, but in classes it really shines. And it makes it a lot easier to manipulate your code. And like I said, constructor is a, a special type of method that you call when you instantiate a class. So this is uh, the code today we'll be using to break down classes. So for this uh, session right now, we're gonna go a little bit more in depth with just one specific class. Uh, I created a, a class for this session, my date. There are some properties that are string. There's a hidden property. And there's uh, the default uh, constructors, constructor. Notice the name of the constructor is my date. And there's one I call without uh, parameters, and there's one that I call with parameters. And there are some static methods that I can use. The, the static methods don't use this, that's just a given. And there's also some void methods that I use to update and just interpret some information. There's also a, a method to, to verify if the date structure that I placed in it is valid. Okay, I guess it's time for some demo. Uh, should I just open it first? So, oops. Like I said, we have the properties, we have uh, the hidden uh, property, and the default constructor. Now the default constructor right now is uh, if I call it without any uh, attributes or parameters, you just get the date, the current date, 
And for next week, I'll just add seven days to that uh, uh, property. And I have an invalid date that I'm using for just uh, to do some certain references and stuff like that. That's the my date with a, a parameter. And for that, I'm going to cast that value and look at that value and see if it's a valid one. If it's valid, then I just get the date and time and do the next week version at the seven days and just keep certain information together. Now I'm doing a try and catch. If the date isn't valid, I'll just give you a warning and say that the, the version of the, the date isn't valid. You should look into your culture, date, time, format for references. I know this. I do know that there are different cultures and stuff like that. So if you take the code and you have a different uh, local ID, it might not work in the first instance. So you need to look into that. Uh, the static method, like I said, can't use this. So what I'm going to do here is just return the current day. And depending on the method that you call, I'll just add a few days to the current date. Or I could add a few weeks to the current date. Now, I also have a method that will add weeks from day that you added to your, your instance. And notice here that what I'm doing is uh, before I uh, add the date, I'm going to do a verify of the day just to be certain that whatever is in that value is valid. So that's one of the, the fun things that you can do with classes is uh, you can actually manipulate and uh, make sure that uh, whatever is entered into that code is valid. And I do the same thing for add days from day. Now, as the method that I just called, this verify day. And verify day will try to parse the value that's in day. And if it's valid, get the date and get the date time. And he'll do the next week. And uh, now you get the picture. Uh, OK, so now it's time for a little bit of initiation. So. Let's just uh, go into some code. We're going to review what about the class. Look at the overload uh, definitions. Uh, let me see what's been a better idea for a presentation. OK, we just do it like this. I'll step into it. So notice here the two overload definitions. There's one without parameters, and there's one with the date. Pretty much. Uh, we can do the same for when it comes to daytime. Oops, let me just. Uh. So notice this is the overload definition for your daytime class. Let's say if you wanted to instantiate a version of this, we can take this one right here. Now can you see that? Right, it's just uh, the int here. So 2017, and then it's the month and the uh, day. And in return, Friday, September 2007. Right? Now, if you want to just look into some more information, the basic information of the, the class, we can do a get member. Right? Uh, let me just. So the get member, notice the type name is equal to my class name, date. And uh, just some uh, default values here. You have the add day, the method. And you have the day and the next week uh, uh, property. But you notice that the invalid date isn't there because that's hidden, right? So to get that uh, value, we need to just add the force, right? So there we have the my date. And notice here the invalid date property. It's there. And you can also access it. It's just not visible. Uh, there's also the method that's still there and the other methods. But 
I also defined a few static methods in it. And we're not seeing those methods. Now, to get those methods, we just use the static. And the static will give you the methods that we defined that don't make use of the, the this uh, property. Now, first that are a bit visually inclined. Add date. Then what you see here is the add days, the methods, and this is, sorry, this part here, these are the static uh, uh, methods that you can call, right? And once we instantiate it, you'll notice that there are different uh, properties that you can, uh, can use. So for instance, we're going to instantiate uh, this uh, value, and we just add day. So instantiate uh, my date with all parameters, and the day is Friday, 22nd September, and the time, and next week will be Friday the 29th. Now if you look at day and the attributes, we have the day next week, we have the add days from day and add weeks from day, and a verify day, right? Now we can call those methods. So to add weeks from day, we'll end up with Friday the 6th of October. That's adding two weeks. Or we can add a few days, extra days. Let's say 23 days from today. That will be Sunday the 15th of October. Right? Just to verify, you have the days here. And he's just doing an addition and subtraction from the value that's in the parameters. Now, we can change, because it's a, a class, we can change the values and stuff like that. So let's just change the value of day to something arbitrary. 1969, that's my birthday. <laughs> Did I mention that it was old? OK. So look into day. And notice that he took the, the value. But the next week is kind of out of whack. I'll be in 1969, and the next week will be in 2017. So that, that's not right. So what we can do now is uh, we can verify day. Right? And once you verify the day, what he does now is, hey, he did July the 8th. And the next week from July the 8th is July the 15th. Go figure. And also the date is also correct now, 1969, right? Now. You can actually do some more uh, values uh, and stuff like that uh, to really play around with it. And you add days from week. Right now, I did a verify before I add a day. So just look at the version there right there, quick. And notice that it's there. But now, if I call the method add days from day, and then I look at the input, so he actually updated that uh, that value to s the, the 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 format that I wanted, and the reason for that is really that when I did the verify, if I add days from days, I did the verify day in that method. I can call that uh, method in other methods. That way, you really can play with uh, how you should uh, validate stuff. Uh, it makes it so much easier to manipulate your your instance. At first, when I started out with the class, I started with one format in mind. That was with the day, day, slash, month, month, slash, year, year. And then I just realized, hey, I could do a lot more than just that class. So I tried instantiating with different uh, formats. And this was also one of them. I used the, the fully, uh, full date format. And then I just did my add dates and uh, look into the versions. It's like, hey. It's all good. It works, right? I can even use a default format 
as 29 September. Just look into that. So the day is 29 September. And I'll do a, a days from day and look into that version again. All right, he changed it from Friday, from September 29 to Friday, September 2017. Now, that's just everything is going okay and well that I place all of the, the, the data the way it should be. Uh, I can skip the random because it's just the same. But what about the invalid date? Invalid date will give me a warning and he tells me that the format is not the way it should be. I'm expecting a day and then month and then year. And look into the invalid. He did instantiate it, but it's empty. Well, not really. It's not empty. I do have the invalid date stored here. So if it went wrong, I can always go back and look at what the problem was. Oh, the date was invalid. Okay, so I need to repa repair that damage. Uh, I'll get uh, a correct date, right? And just look at the invalid version now. So he filled in the day. Next week isn't really filled in yet. I can do a verify and look into the input again. So I've got the correct version. He filled it in next week. And what did he do with the invalid date? Well, that's empty. He just reset that because it's correct now. OK, so that was my first instinct when I started out with it was always about verify day. But then just yesterday, reviewing all of my code, I'm thinking to myself, oh, I got everything, it's, it's OK. And then I just thought to myself, wait a second. What would happen if they edit the next week value instead of the next day? Ah, because you know that is possible. So what are you going to do with that? So then I did a quick review of my code, and I came up with this. Uh, let's just go forward. So it's actually basically the same code, but instead of if someone decided to uh, update the next week, uh, what I would need to do is actually verify next week, but next week would pass the, the, the value. And instead of adding days to day, I would need to remove days from that week. And what you do with, uh, then I also have the, the, the methods. There's a method for remove days from next week, and there's a method for remove weeks from next week. So you have the same thing here with the, the values that you have the overloads. That would be the same. The members, the force. Here you have for the static. I have a few. Add days from week, from today, and add weeks from today. And well, let's just go through this one version. Go into day. So I'm going to just go back to this version. That's a lot easier. So it's instantiated for today. We can add the weeks from day, but the fun part now is just that I can also remove days. So if it's the 29th and I remove two days from next week, or I can remove two weeks from next week. Or I can also do a just update next week. If you look in today, notice the next week is 1969 and the day is Friday 22nd of uh, 2017. Very fine next week. And now it's reset to July the 1st. So for me, it really, when it comes to classes, it's really about looking at your model and looking at the methods that you would like to, to, 
let loose on your on your class on your identity and then just really focus on how you how they would interact with it it's a lot more to discover a lot more well actually it's kind of a lot more fun in my opinion when you really look at your you can create a lot of modules and a lot of functions and helpers but once you sit down and really think about a class and how to interact with it you'll notice that there's a whole new possibility the possibilities are really uh, a lot more fancy to get uh, technical into uh, validating values and what if scenarios if somebody fills in the wrong value or what to do with uh, validating if the value is correct and stuff like that that is really uh, something uh, uh, worth considering now uh, let me just go back I promised a demo transition code to a class so for the next part of the demonstration we're going to go through a few examples uh, this is something that actually I did over the years uh, using PowerShell uh, I've been through all of these uh, transition steps and uh, maybe some of them might be familiar to you or maybe not but uh, the challenge here is to uh, get the file size in kilobytes, megabytes or gigabytes and each example will be an improvement on the other. Uh, well, at least it should be, right? Uh, and at the end, we'll just make a class of the, the whole transition, right? All right, so the first example, how are we going to get file size to operate? So this code is probably just known for us all. Huh? You need to get the files, and I'm looking for the base name, the full name, and the length, right? And just get the size of that. Now, the length of a file in a get child item is bytes. Uh, depending on the size of the file, it's not really that legible, huh? So, if you just run this code, what you're going to get here, I have a few files that are in that directory. Now, there's a length in bytes. Yeah, try to go figure that out. It, it's accurate, but what you would like to do is I would like to get the size in, in kilobytes, right? Now, what you would basically do, I guess this is for all of us uh, as uh, PowerShell guys, we curse, we get the file size, select, and then you'll just do an expression in your select, get the size in kilobytes, put a label, and do an expression, change the size and the length divided by one KB, and that will give me the size in kilobytes, right? <coughs> all you guys familiar with the expression? Okay. So then there's no surprise, that's what comes out here. So there's a file that's for 5K, one, but it's also uh, 71,570 kilobyte file. I think I'd probably like to have that one in MBs, right? That's a lot more, that makes a lot more sense. Uh, sure, okay. I guess the next best thing would be to just add a few more uh, expressions to it. Huh? So instead of just the key B, I'll just add the megabyte and also the gigabyte, right? And when you look into that now, looking at the size, sure, there's a 4.95 gigabytes, but it's zero MB or zero gigs. Yeah, whatever that means, right? So you notice that the, the format depends really on the size. When you come down to uh, the megabyte file, okay, so this is a little more legible, but a 0 0.7 gigabit, yeah, it doesn't really add up. If you wanted to use that uh, data to, to do the total of your files and stuff like that, that would just give you a bad output, right? So that gives you a weird list. Uh, ah, 
So the next best thing you could do is use add member. Anyone uh, familiar with the, the add, member, add member commandlet? Yeah. Well, it's always been around, but I guess most of us will probably just use a function and just get it over with or do probably a select and uh, just get the information that we want, right? To me, the add member feels like a, a, a forgotten something. You know, it's like, okay, I, I've got my, my object. Oh, and by the way, I should just do like a, something of a method to get the size and stuff like that. Sure, we can do that. And what you get now, you really need to instantiate the file. So I'm going to do a for each, create a custom object, and then add for script method, look into files, This is the size, but if I wanted to have the size in gigabyte, it'll give me just the output. Or in megabyte, I can do the last version, the last one. And go into the kilobytes. That one didn't do what I thought it would do. Uh, why didn't you figure that out? No, no matter. But to figure out the different files versions, you can then take one version. It's like, okay, so I want to have my file size in. Oh, I noticed he did something wrong here. He didn't take the version. Uh, I'm sorry. Size in bytes. Need to autocorrect my code here. That's when you get when you have too many code uh, editing and stuff like that. So go one more and go here. Ah, that's a lot better. So you have the size in bytes, or I can also do the size in MBs, which doesn't really make much sense, or the file size in gigabytes, right? And this was what I wanted to do. You take the file, the base name, but looking at the file size in kilobytes of the last file, I would rather have this in MBs, right? So I can actually call that version, and this would be a lot better, a better fit. But instead of going through all of the motion of going to figuring out what is KB or MB or gigabyte, I think I'd probably use something like a filter and get the file size and then just uh, interpret uh, the version or the, the correct size of the, of the data. Anyone ever use a filter? Usually we all use functions. A filter is just a, a function, but just he goes through every item in the, in the pipeline. So let me just clear that. Oh, let me just do the format list. And what he does now is instead of going through the key bees and stuff like that, he just does the formatting for you uh, before he, enter, he edits it. The, the version version, the file size. Here. So I do a uh, get the length and pipeline to the file size, and the file size will just return a formatted version. Right? Well, okay. Instead of using a filter, we could use the same thing. Instead of using uh, the filter, we use an add member and a script method, size formatted. And for the size formatted, we'll just use the method that we defined with the add member.
Now the fun part with the uh, add member is uh, notice the this variable that we use in classes. So it's been there all along, and just with classes is a lot more uh, evident there. So look into the classes here. And the file size is formatted. We're using something basically that we all know and uh, we can all get behind this, right? As a, as a function. Uh, there's nothing uh, really extraordinary about that. Yeah, OK. So let's try and make a class of this. And the class, we have a file size. We have the string, the base name, the full name, and then the in64, because uh, depending on the file sizes, uh, you could get real big uh, bytes uh, uh, return. So better to be on the safe side, just made that uh, in64. Do the size format, and just also a hidden invalid file, right? And we have our constructors, which are just uh, empty or with a full name. And what you're going to do is, if you have a, a full name, you can test that file name. And if it's valid, I'm going to get the child item. And from that child item, I'm going to get all of the properties that I need and instantiate and return the value in that object. And if the size is valid, I'm going to do the size formatting. And invalid would be null. And if it doesn't exist, I'll just save that invalid file. And we can use that to, to see exactly what went wrong or why isn't it valid. Right? So the size formatted is just a void uh, uh, method. And he's not going to return any value, but he's going to manipulate the size in bytes. And he's going to add that version of that value to the size formatted. Right? And just for giggles, I also created <laughs> a static method. Notice there's one that is void and one that is static. And what this will do is just return the value. So he's not going to update anything. He's just going to take the value from the file that you found, and he's just going to give you the output of that file, of the file size. And there's also the verify version just to be sure that everything is as it should be. So basically, the same thing again we're going to do. We can go through the overload definitions, that is, without and with a parameter. We can get the basic uh, information of your, your class. See the name there, file size. There are the properties. There's the method and the size file method. Notice that it's also void. So he tells you exactly what is going on with the file. But at the same time, we have a size formatted that is static. And that's the fun you can have with classes, is that you can overload your, your methods uh, depending on how you want to use your, your method. <laughs> Don't worry. So for this instance, I have uh, classes in my directory. Uh, let me just put it in format, format list. Right, and he's going to get me back all of the information formatted correctly. But what I wanted to do right now is grab a class, or grab an, an instance from the of an item from the the collection, and just change that up. So I give it a name that's not verified, doesn't exist. 
and when I go into invalid file, he'll tell me that, hey, this file isn't valid anymore, right? So what I can do right now is just repair that. So I added the file, and he found it, and he repaired it, and I'm good to go again. The invalid file has also been uh, reset back to null. And like I said, the size format is also a static version. So if I try to call it with an illegal file name, he can't find it. But with a legal file name, he'll give me back the size, just the size. And just for giggles, I also created an array with a few files that are just not correct. Instantiate that version. And he's giving me a warning that a few files don't exist. Now, looking into the results and the information, you notice that he's missing a few, right? Now, I know exactly which ones are missing. So, this is the fun part with the whole instantiating. I can just go into the invalidate file and he'll give me back all of the, the, the entries that are invalid. And just like that, I can also edit. So I know which ones are invalid, so I just replace the full name. I don't need to go through every file, but I can just do also a .NET verify files, right? And then when you go into the invalid, they're all gone, right? And when you look at the results, yeah, they're all fixed again, right? So that's really the, the fun things that you can do with classes. I know I have only have five more minutes, or I'm down to two, precisely, precisely. So let's just get back to uh <laughs> So why use classes? Well, everything is in one place. Uh, you can use IntelliSense to discover what's uh, possible on your, on your instance, on your class. There's a whole lot of discoverability. There's a lot you can do once you, you get into the mindset of using classes to update, and it will probably give you more uh, easier access to debugging. You know that, uh, for instance, with the get next week, when I just looked at it, I was so focused on the day that I totally forgot about the next week, but it's there, so you, you have a lot more discoverability. And uh, the bonus part is uh, it makes you feel more like a developer. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I don't know, any questions? Okay, yes? Uh, like look, uh, Deccan said, uh, you have uh, your, your, your classes, you can use a base class, you can do inheritance. Yes, you can. You can do inheritance. Uh, I didn't choose uh, to use inheritance at, uh, with, my, my, with my presentation, but that is a possibility. And it's really uh, easy to extend. So you have the base and you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Definitely worth looking into. Yes? Is it, is it possible to make some of those properties read only well that is one of the things I was looking into when I did the, the get next week I was like so I would actually just like them to just use that uh, the next day of the day and not edit the next week uh, and I must admit I owe you that uh, answer but it did cross my mind it did cross my mind sure definitely uh, Uh, I take it like the way I kind of see it, you yeah. don't have these classes. Yeah. Like you want them accessible. Oh, yeah, well, like, um, June has, June, June Blender had a, a she has a, a blog, or she had a blog with Sabian, how you can make your, your classes more discoverable. It's, for instance, with modules and stuff like that, you can put it in your module part and it's just discoverable. But with classes, you got to do it a little bit more, it's a little bit more interactive to get it really uh, available. Oh, my time is up. Sorry, guys. Uh, so after the session, uh, there's uh, uh, time for uh, drinks. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be there because uh, I need to fly back uh, to, the, to the Netherlands. So, uh, But anyway, I'd like to thank you guys for taking the time to come to my presentation. And uh, maybe till next time, huh? <laughs> okay.